Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar. I'm Sarah Muriello with Pasadena Humane. I'm wearing my headphones today because uh, the gardeners are outside and I realized that you wouldn't be able to hear us today. Um, so with us is Fernando Diaz, our behavior and training manager, who's gonna present um, a webinar on cats enrichment and training for happy, healthy relationships. Um, and before I turn it over to him, I just wanted to walk you through a few quick webinar reminders. So give me a second to switch screens. All right, so here we go. Um, so all of you are automatically um, muted, so uh, we're, we won't be able to hear you um, during this webinar, um, but you should be able to hear us. Um, and we won't be able to see you, but you should be able to see us um, and or our screens. We're going to ask that you save your questions for the end. Um, we have some a uh, few minutes set aside for a Q&A with Fernando. The way that you're going to submit your questions to us is by using that chat box. Um, so it's under the questions tab. We ask that you not raise your hand. Uh, that raise your hand feature is only um, uh, applicable when we're using audio uh, feature for the audience, which we're not going to be using today. Um, so go ahead and hit that question drop down, uh, type any question you may have into the chat. I'm the only one who's going to see your question and as time permits, I'll go ahead and get it over to Fernando for the Q&A. We also want to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and tomorrow afternoon you're going to receive an email with a link to the recording so you can watch it anytime. And we also have a free upcoming webinar happening um, next Wednesday, August 12th, Gardening for Wildlife. And that's going to be presented uh, by Catherine Pacraduni, who's a, a horticulturalist, a native plant horticulturalist with Theodore Payne Foundation. Um, and we're really, really looking forward to that. So if you're interested, please register at PasadenaHumane.org slash workshops. All right, and with that, I'm gonna have Fernando take it away. Just give us a minute to switch screens. All right, I think we're all set. Um, so yes, today we're gonna to talk about cats and, and Really, it's about our how we relate to cats, how we engage with them. And part of that is knowing a little bit more about our companions, uh, where they come from. So there's a lot that kind of goes into this whole discussion. So this is kind of a short version of it. Um, but hopefully in the Q&A, we can kind of address any specific questions. And then, uh, of course, you can always reach out with other questions in the future. Uh, Fernando, could we ask you to go to full screen? Is that possible uh, with with the slide? Sorry about yes. that. Let's see. There we go. How's that? Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So um, cats, they came from the African wildcat, which still is out there today. Um, and interestingly enough, they were actually domesticated not once but twice. So uh, the original domestication 10,000 years ago, that's where our modern day cats come from. Um, in Egypt, they took the same African wildcat, uh, which actually does go into that area a little bit, and re-domesticated it further down the line. Um, and what's really interesting about this, unlike dogs and other animals that we've domesticated, cat domestication occurred a little bit differently. Um, they, the color changed, but that was a very recent change, actually. The initial cats were pretty much brown tabbies. Um, as we know them today. And it was only in, in re relatively recent history that we started breeding for specific colors and, and different shapes like the munchkins and whatnot. Um, they were also smaller, but genetically speaking, there's not much of a difference. Now, this is what we call phenotypical uh, changes, uh, meaning the body changes, the way you look at it changes, but the genotype, the genes, they remain pretty close to the, what was originally there. And I'm going to kind of touch back on that as we talked about this discussion, but that's really important to remember, because uh, as, as Jackson Galaxy often kind of remarks, these are wild hunters. These are, you know, th th that hasn't changed at all. And so we have to treat them in that sense in, in some ways. So I figured I'd start off with the beginning. 
Um, you, for those of you who are either considering to bring home a cat, we have lots here in the shelter, um, or those who recently have a cat home. You know, there's a, there's a tendency to open up the, the carrier, the box, whatever it is they came in and say, welcome home. And that's a lot for a cat. You know, like, like humans, cats don't respond to change well. And so however big or small your home is, it's gonna be huge to the cat. And that's a lot for them to take in all at once. And if there are other cats or other animals in the house or people even, that can be a lot. So I typically recommend a small room like a bathroom. Now, I often get a lot of hesitation when I make that recommendation, you know, isn't that too small? And that's actually just right for most cats. A nice small room where you can have space for a litter box, maybe a bed, um, food and water, of course, and give them time to adapt. Let them get used to that space. And they will let you know when they're ready to move out. And, and, and when they do, when they start to show, you know, inquisitive behaviors, starting to explore the doorway, um, we want to still leave that base set up in the bathroom, but we can then open the door. And at that point, they have a space they can retreat to if they get overwhelmed. Now, this, this kind of setup is, is for your typical situation with just one cat in the home. If you have multiple cats and you're doing an introduction, we then want to look at the actual introduction process, and that'll mean that they spend a little more time in that bathroom. But don't, don't be afraid to leave your cat in a small space. Go in there, take a bath, hang out, sit with them. They'll appreciate that but they'll appreciate having that tiny space that they can kind of get used to and really adapt to before they get accustomed to the rest of your home. So another part of having a cat is toys. You know, environmental enrichment is huge for cats. Um, they are hunters and you'll notice a lot of the cat toys out there replicate uh, things that they would hunt, whether it be mice or birds, but what we do want to be careful with is things that are potentially dangerous to cats. Um, and I have that twisty tie there in the middle, that little green thing, uh, deliberately as a reminder for me, because I wanted to talk to you about my cat that I used to have named Gavin. He loved twisty ties. He played with them all day, and I thought it was fun. And then one day I found a twisty tie in his feces. That had to be the end of the twisty ties. Um, things like twisty ties and strings, they can easily get ingested and cause blockages or, or, or other issues. And so we wanna make sure that any toys that we give our cats, they're appropriate um, so that they can play safely. Now, I mentioned that cats are hunters and they still want to hunt. Now, you've never been to a zoo and seen a giant food bowl given to the tigers because tigers wanna to hunt too. And so while we're not gonna give the same types of toys to our, our domestic cats, we do wanna give them puzzle feeders, things that they can engage with to actually uh, forage and hunt for their food. Now, this does not have to be just a snack. This could be their whole meal. Uh, and one of the nice things about doing things this way is it divorces you from the feeding process. Now that means that those cats that start yowling as soon as you approach the food area, they're less likely to do that. Um, at one point I had three cats and when I switched to doing all feeder objects for their meals, it was so much more peaceful and they loved it. They would engage these toys of, of varying complexity. Um, and I had a girl who actually that one on the far left, she loved that toy. It took her a little while to get it, but she got good at it. Um, and so giving them an option to really hunt and forage for their food is really important. Now, when I first started working with cats, there weren't a lot of options. Nowadays, there's no limit, there's tons and tons of options. And for those of you who are do-it-yourselfers, it doesn't have to be complex. I mean, there are websites where they, they'll show you how to make all kinds of complex feeder objects that um, require work and effort. And, you know, I had one with a, a bottle and a string and a plug, but it could just be a box with a hole in it. You want that hole small enough so they can get their paw in there, but not their whole head. So they can work for it a little bit. Um, so really, if you just Google puzzle feeders for cats, you'll find a ton of options out there. So don't be afraid to experiment a little bit and, and get your cat something fun to, to, to hunt for. One of the things I do want to caution you from is let's not get the most complex toy for a first timer. Cats need to learn how to use these toys. And if they're not accustomed to them, 
they may need something a little simple at first. And again, cats being hunters, they want to have a safe place to go to. Cats occupy a very unique niche in, in, the, in the wild in that they're both predator and prey. And so having some place safe that they can go back to is very important. Now we've all seen the videos and pictures and memes of cats in boxes. Um, and it's a reason they like them. They're nice, small, they're snug. And for those of you who've ever had a cat in a situation where they, the cat was frightened, whether it be an alarm goes off or people are coming into the house when they're not accustomed to that, they often, especially if they're not very well socialized, they'll disappear into the tiniest hole they can fit in. Something small that you probably even thought they could fit in because that's a safe place for them. Now there's lots of options for making these safe zones and they don't have to be very expensive. And a lot of times cats will pick the box that the expensive toy came in and use that instead. But that's okay, they have that choice. So along with having a safe bedding, cats as hunters want to be able to survey their realm. And so having a nice uh, heightened place is really important as well. Now this serves multiple purposes. Cats are all about their territory, their space. They need to feel secure that they can actually get all the, the nutrients and resources that they need in their environment. And whether you have a small town home or a mansion, it's really up to the cat to figure out what they're comfortable with, what, what space they, they if, if they have enough space for themselves. And so one way to create more space is to create height space. And you can go very elaborate, like the picture on the right there, or you can go something simple and just say, okay, I'm gonna dedicate this shelf for a spot for my cat to lay in. And that'll be good. You'll often find that they will find their own space and it may be a challenge to keep them from taking some of these places. And, and that's kind of a personal thing, whether or not you are okay with that, but providing them with some place that they can get to that's tall, it's high up, is very important for cats. This can also help with problem problematic behaviors where cats are maybe struggling to either get along with another cat or another animal in the household, or maybe they're just scared and you know there's a new cat or an under-socialized cat. Giving them someplace tall they can go to can give them a feeling of security where they feel safe and sound and are less likely to experience and exhibit those fearful behaviors. Um, I had a cat that we actually put shelves just for the cat and put a little carpet on those shelves and we put it up so it went over a doorway and I would often find a cat just lounging, hanging out over the doorway. She felt safe there. So be creative, find spaces for your cat, allow them to feel safe and secure. And so I put this picture here because it's important to me that not only do we have space for a cat, but we have the right type of space. And so if I was that brown and white tabby at the bottom of the stairs, and there was a beautiful sunspot at the top of the stairs, there's a huge challenge to my getting there now. Because whether or not I'm good buddies with that orange and white tabby, I've got to invade his space or her space to get to that nice, comfortable spot. The, I think it's a kind of a tan colored one on the right there, the far right, you can probably just jump up and skip the whole process. And that's kind of what we want to look at. When we have a cat and it has a central spot that it tends to like, whether it be the heat register or a sunspot, or maybe it's just someplace close to you where you tend to work or, or hang out at, you want to make sure that they have multiple venues to get to that spot. So they don't have to cross each other's paths. That'll help to re reduce a lot of the conflict that often occurs when cats have to invade each other's spaces. I actually had a, I couldn't find a picture, but I, I had a picture of, of when I had four cats at one point and they were laying on a bed. And at first glance, you would have said, oh, look, they get along so well. But they were all on the exact far edges of the bed. So as far away from each other as they can get, looking in opposite directions. That was a situation where there was a central space that they all wanted. And so they chose not to have conflict, but they weren't happy about it either. And, and that can be something that's undermining that stays in the situation. And then a sudden change in the environment can cause that to become explosive. And where you actually have problems where cats start to fight all of a sudden. 
And that's oftentimes kind of the situation where someone may say, I've had these cats for so long and they've gotten along all this time. And then suddenly they're fighting and I don't know why. You know, it's, it's something that was undermined that was sitting there that entire time and we didn't really address it. Likewise, cats tend to maintain high cortisol levels from stressful situations for extended periods of time. That means that the situation that caused that conflict could have happened a week ago, two weeks ago. I've heard of it even a month ago. And so it can sometimes be a challenge to find exactly what the conflict point was. But regardless of the conflict point, key, key factors is that environmental enrichment, having safe places to go to, having heightened spots that they can reach, having ways that they can get there without crossing each other can really do a lot to help those situations. Catnip. We all love giving our cats catnip. And sometimes it's a great thing, and sometimes it's not. It actually affects them from a, a, an odor perspective. And so it's kind of like a drug um, that they, they smell and they, they get a high, if you would. Um, but kittens tend to not respond to catnip. Um, with a certain age limit where they hit, and, and they actually can get desensitized. Meaning, if you're using catnip on a regular basis and there's just lots of catnip everywhere, you know, sprinkling like fairy dust, your cat may stop responding to that catnip. It just gets a higher tolerance. Um, there are also specific situations where you may not want to use catnip. So if you have a, one of those cats that gets overstimulated easily, and you know if you do, they tend to get very fluffy and very bitey and, and they'll grab your hand or whatever it is that's near them and start funny kicking for no apparent reason that you can discern. Sometimes giving those cats catnip can just make the situation worse. Sometimes it's a release. And so if you have one of those situations where your cat is maybe showing these unwanted behaviors and you are using catnip, I'd recommend maybe trying not to use catnip for a little while. See if you see a change. Um, there are other steps that we can take to help with that, and I'll get into that momentarily, but that may be enough to just knock off the edge. Likewise, I've also seen cats that were not getting catnip that were able to kind of get a release from having catnip and stop showing those same behaviors. You know, each cat's going to be an individual and their biology is going to be a little bit different in how they respond. So don't be afraid to experiment a little bit, but we want to be safe and make sure that we are not putting ourselves in a position where we might get hurt. So this one's always a touchy subject. Uh, laser toys, there's, there, there's a lot of fun with them. And when I first started work, when I first had a cat, I, I played with them as well. Um, but it can be very frustrating. And I don't know if any of you have seen those old movies. I think it was Buster Keaton. Who, you have that dollar bill on the floor and he tries to grab it and somebody pulls away and he keeps jumping at it and it keeps disappearing. That's kind of what the laser toy does for cats. We've got this great, well-built, defined hunter and he just can't catch his prey no matter how hard he tries. Even when he thought he had it, it slips out from under him. That's one of the things that can actually lead to problematic behaviors like the overstimulation um, and, and other aggressive behaviors where cats get so frustrated that, that they respond poorly. And so I highly recommend if you're using laser toys, we, we, we cease using them. Um, as fun as it is for us, it is very frustrating for animals, um, but there are alternatives. There are other options to laser toys um, and, and other things that we can do to uh, engage our cats to have fun. And so, you know, we can look at those feeder objects I talked about. Um, watching a cat learn how to use a new feeder object, that, that's a lot of fun. You're watching them think and learn and process. Um, and there are toys that they can use, and some of them can be a lot of fun. You know, the little ball and the plastic thing that spins around or feather toys, or they, they now have those that kind of make a little mouse sounds when they get whacked around. Those will be a lot of fun for you and the cat, and they still give the cat that tangible feeling of, I'm getting something out of this. So uh, laser toys, not so great, but there are a lot of other options. One option that I'm a huge, huge fan of is something we call play therapy. And so play therapy is really uh, giving your cat an opportunity to hunt, just straight up go for the kill. Um, but it's, it's, it's in a controlled environment, and it gives them that exercise, it gets them the release, um, and it can help with a lot of these overstimulation behaviors. Uh, it can also help just with the general enrichment and exercise. 
but it has to be done in a specific way to really reap those benefits. And so one of the things that we're looking at is we have to use one of these wand type toys. Um, and you know, there's lots of different brands out there. Some of them like the bird actually have the feathers split a certain way so that when it flies through the air, it sounds like a wounded bird. Um, we've got the mice, we've got little snake ones. Key rule though is whatever object it is, you have to play as if the object was real. And so the feather toy is a bird. It's gonna fly through the air, it's gonna hop. It's not gonna drag itself along the ground. Likewise, the mouse is gonna drag itself along the ground. It's not gonna fly. I'd be very scared of a flying mouse. So we wanna mimic those things. Also bear in mind, cats are individuals and individual hunters have this developed individual preferences. And so you may have a cat that prefers birds. You may have a cat that prefers mice and you may need to experiment. The nice thing is they have refills for a lot of these toys. So once you get the initial wand, you can buy the refills pretty cheaply. Another rule of, of this game is that it's done routinely. So ideally every day at around the same time. This builds an expectation in your cat where it knows I'm gonna have this opportunity to hunt and have this fun every day, same time. This is awesome. And lastly, like every great hunter, they get to reap the rewards of their effort. So they need to have a snack. And so some sort of meat is what we're looking at. It can be deli meat, though I highly recommend you stay away from things like the Cajun turkey and the fancy stuff. You know, some plain chicken or turkey or something. Um, and just a small amount. We're not trying to fatten them up or make a meal, but they get their, uh, it could be tuna. You know, you, you can use just about any meat that's safe for them as long as it's meat, because hunters eat meat. And cats, if you don't already know, are obligate carnivores. They need the, the, the taurine in, in the meat to live. They cannot be vegetarians. And so they hunt, they kill, they eat. And that's fun for us, and it's fun for them. Though I do want to warn you, cats sometimes can take away a little bit of the fun from us. I did have one cat that would sit there and hunker to the ground and watch the bird fly back and forth and watch it go over and over until I was bored stiff and then she'd pounce and kill the bird. And so it was a little less fun for me, but she got what she needed out of it because she was an ambush hunter versus some that are very happy just chasing this object all over the place. So it's good for your cat either way. Um, and it's really enriching and it helps them to get a lot of that extra energy out of their system. And here's a short video on that. It's always fun watching kittens do stuff like that and all the acrobatics. But I've actually also seen older cats that had gotten sedentary suddenly liven up a little bit when introduced to play therapy. So it's not necessarily a bad thing for an older cat. Um, you do want to watch their exertion levels because um, cats sometimes keep on hunting till they're exhausted. And you know, if they're starting to breed a little heavily, it's okay to give them one last catch of the prey and then give them the meat. Uh, we don't need to play with them until they've dropped. Another option is actual training. And I often get people tell me, you can't train a cat, or how do you train a cat? And I found this meme online and it kind of hit me just because I had a cat that loved to get on a kitchen table. I know, something probably pretty unique out there, except she would also bring litter. And, I, and that's just gross. I, I don't want your litter on my kitchen table. And so I tried picking her up and putting her down, giving her treats somewhere else. But she really wanted to get up there because it was the highest point in the room. Um, so that led me to two things. One, I needed to create a higher spot for her. Two, I decided to try to train her to not get on the kitchen table. And it actually turned out to be easier than I thought. I got my clicker. Um, now with cats, it's very important to get one of these soft clickers, you know, the metal uh, box clickers it can be too loud and abrupt for them most times. Um, and then I got a reinforcer that she liked. And I don't think there's any science behind this, but you know, my personal experience, Gerber, turkey and gravy can't be beat. Um, I typically stay away from some of the off-brands 
they may be a little bit cheaper, but the consistency isn't there. And um, I've had mixed results at best with those. Um, and so I started teaching my cat the target. It was, I offer my fingertip about three to four inches from your nose. You move to touch it with your nose. I click at the point of contact. I then give you a small amount of baby food, just a little bit. And we continue doing that. And as she got good at doing that, I started targeting her from the kitchen table down to the chair in the kitchen. And so I just kept putting my finger further and further away from her until eventually I could be across the room. I would snap my finger to get her attention, point down, and she would proudly come trotting over because she knew she was going to get a treat for that. And after a while, she's just stopped getting on the kitchen table altogether. So there's a lot you can do with, with, with uh, cats in training. Um, and it can get as simple, as complex as you like. You know, cats are capable of being trained to do anything they're physically capable of doing. Um, and it can be something utilitarian, like targeting and, and getting off objects, or, or it can be a recall, you know, training your cat to come when they're called. Uh, it can be something cute, like a, a sit pretty, where they sit up on their back legs and put their paws up. There's no limit to what we can teach them. And it'd be a lot of fun. I had a friend who actually, decided to do an experiment where she got a kitten and from day one, she did training sessions. And so by the time Mikey was about three or four, she'd come home from work, he'd hop up on the kitchen counter because that's where the clicker was. And he would sit there and wait, letting her know it's time to train. And so she had to come, constantly come up with new things and, it, and she challenged friends, you know, I can, let's see who's the quickest person to train our cat to do behavior X. Uh, and, and the cat was really, really enriched, very intelligent. Um, and it also helped with energy levels because of that training process where you're forcing your cat to think and process, they actually are able to reduce a lot of stress that way. So there's really no limit to what you can teach your cat. Um, it's really up to you and, and what you want to do. So a couple of things on that short video there. Uh, this was a shelter cat. And so deliberately using a syringe there because medical staff will often use syringes for medication. And a lot of that medication does not taste good. And so by using baby food in a syringe, I create this positive association to the syringe. This means that when vet staff came in to treat a cat, the cat was more likely to have a favorable response and require less restraint and work to actually get the medication. And if they've got baby food out of a syringe 10 times and medicine once, they're still likely to have a very favorable response to that syringe. You also notice the initial targeting, the cat was very close to the finger. Um, and I'll play this video again in a moment so you can see that um, in case you missed it. But as the, this one session continued, we began stretching a little further away, causing the cat to get up and even take a step. And that's that process I was talking about where you work with a cat to teach it to extend that target. You know, the target is a very simple, easy behavior. It's one of my favorites because it can be done under relatively stressful situations, um, but it gives the cat something to learn. And you can use that to manipulate their body and where they're at, their movement. Um, that can be something that can be used with, I don't know, teaching a cat to go into a carrier. So, you know, those of us who are bringing our cats to the vet, um, this probably sounds pretty familiar to, to many of us. You know, we have the carrier in a closet somewhere. And then the morning we're going to the vet, we pull the carrier out. We proceed to chase the cat around the house, um, grab a towel and wrap it up and shove it into the carrier uh, where it goes to the vet, gets poked and trotted. And of course that temperature taken. And then they come home and then the carrier goes back into the closet. Now in that situation, we don't have a good, relationship with that carrier it's it's just this this thing of, of, of bad associations and so using targeting around and in a, into a carrier 
can actually train your cat is one way to train your cat to willingly go into a carrier and really make your life significantly easier. Um, not to mention, you reduce the risk of a cat bite or cat scratch, which can lead to infection. So while it's a very simple behavior, it's very versatile and offers a lot of options. Let's see that one more time, just so you can see. It's just a couple of licks there and it's very close. And that's a small syringe, so you know, we're not giving the cat a lot of baby food there. It's just enough so we, we give that reinforcer. And there's the step. And, and she actually got a little bit more baby food on that session because of the bigger step. We temporarily lose her because some of the baby food fell. But then she re-engaged. Now, one last thing to, to say about uh, clicker training is you always want to end the session. And so if you're clicker training your cat and you're making this great progress and then suddenly you start to slow down and you realize you're, it's taking longer to, for the cat to engage or maybe the cat's a little more distracted, the cat could be getting satiated, you know, maybe it's just not hungry anymore, um, or it could be just that the cat's mentally exhausted from the training and the thinking and the physical exhaustion that corresponds with that. And so they're kind of getting done. Now, if the cat decides, I'm done, I'm going back to bed, see ya, you're less likely to have good engagement the next time because the cat's got control of the situation in the respect of, I can get this training whenever I want. I just don't really feel like it today. Now, if you stop and the cat's fully engaged and still eating baby food, then it's more of a, hey, 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 wait a second. I wasn't done. I can do more. And so you're going to get that eager engagement the next time because your cat had to stop short. Um, so hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Uh, a friend of mine kind of compared it to bringing his kids to the zoo. If they go to the zoo and they see every single animal, eh, I saw the giraffes last time, versus I never got to see the hippos. Let's go to the zoo again. All right, so challenges. In any of these sessions, I, I usually get um, some challenges thrown up. Um, what if my cat will not eat in front of me? That's one of the common ones. Food is usually a, a challenge, and it could be a number of different things. Are we doing our training session right after breakfast or dinner? We're full. Are we using low value treats? You know, if you decide, you know, my cat eats kibble or um, these, these crunchies or whatever, and so I'm gonna use that. But they're not really enough to work for. You know, uh, it, it may not be enough to really get your cat motivated. Um, if it's a new cat or, or a fearful cat, it may be your very presence, in which case it's okay to put the food down and walk away. And the cat will either eat while you're gone, or maybe it won't. But if you continue that process, I've very rarely seen a circumstance where the cat didn't eventually eat. Um, so look at your timing, look at your, the value of your treats, and lastly, look at yourself and walk out the door if you need to. Um, it'll get better. What if my cat will not target my finger? Um, now, Targeting is, is a great behavior in that, it, as I said, it can be done under high stress and it can also be done, uh, it's very easy. It's a natural behavior. What is this in front of me? Let me investigate. Um, but if you've got a fearful cat or a cat you don't have a relationship with, they may struggle. And in that case, it's okay for you to select other options. And so, you know, I offered a target, my cat looked at it, but wouldn't come forward. So I'm gonna click and treat for looking at it for now. We can work on the coming forward to touch later, um, you know, baby steps. It could also be something anatomical. If you're holding your finger too high up, especially in initial training sessions, it's not natural to the cat. And so I often find that placing my finger closer to the ground actually gives me better results. So where you have your hand is also very important. What if my cat is afraid of the sound of the clip? So that's kind of what I talked about earlier with those box flippers. They're made of metal and it's a spring and it's very abrupt. Um, and so getting one of those cat type clippers that are plastic can be helpful. Their sound isn't quite as bad. Um, if it's a quiet room, 
You can even use a, a clicking pencil or a pen that is. Um, you can take the clicker and put it behind you or in a pocket. You know, there's lots of options. What I will say is I've never seen an animal in my experience that didn't eventually come to see the clicker as a positive, even if they were initially afraid when paired with those yummy, yummy, high value treats. And so eventually it becomes a, that thing scared me, but it preceded this yummy thing. Maybe it's not so bad after all. And then lastly, what if my cats will not eat my treat at all? Uh, and at that point, typically I'm looking at value. It, it could again be the timing. You know, we wanna make sure the cat's hungry, um, but looking at value and looking at variation. You know, I've used, I had one cat that was very difficult to find treats for. And I used Bonito Flakes. You know, you can get them in a the supermarket. And he loved them. Um, he would do almost anything for a Bonito Flake. And so experimenting and trying different things can be very helpful. Um, deli meats usually a win. Baby food, meat flavored baby food. You know, don't get the uh, squash and, and pudding or whatever. Um, but don't be afraid to try different things, um, including human food. As long as it's not overly spicy, you should be okay. All right. And so I'd, I'd be amiss if I didn't mention all of these supplies are available at our shelter shop. Um, we have the, the wand type toys and various types of treats. Um, you can call your order in and just pick it up at, on the go. Um, and it's nice and convenient that way for you. Last but not least, if you are trying this training and you're struggling, or if you have specific behavior problems that are not addressed either throughout this conversation or in the uh, chat afterwards, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we are here to help. We have the free behavior helpline. Um, and I needed to update that. I, we actually do it all online now. So if you go to PasadenaHumane.org training, you can actually schedule your own time for us to call you. And it's a 15 minute call. So we do keep them down to 15 minutes and it's, it's meant for simple problems that can be quickly addressed. Um, or we have the option of scheduling a virtual behavior consult if you have a more complex problem or if you're looking for more um, personal assistance in that, you know, being able to see someone's face. Um, and you can schedule that for yourself as well, for cats, dogs, or any of the other critters. All right. And with that, I open up the questions. Thanks, Fernando. I'm gonna I'm gonna join on camera here, so I'm not a, a disembodied voice. Um, so one of the questions that we got um, was, I have a 20 year old cat who is no longer interested in playing. I suspect that arthritis makes it painful for her to run or chase. What can I do to stimulate her and relieve boredom? Very good question. Um, and what it, first thing that comes to my mind is we, we're suspecting arthritis. So let's have a conversation with a vet. Let's look at maybe a medication can help, you know, some sort of pain reliever or an anti-swelling or something. I, I don't know, I'm not a vet, but you know, having a conversation with a vet and explaining your situation may solve the problem right there and then if arthritis is a limiting factor. Other options, you know, once we've ruled out the medical aspect of things, um, is looking at enrichment, you know, set trails, leaving small treats around, um, the feeder objects, huge plus. Um, you know, some of those low key energy behaviors uh, can be very helpful, as well as the clicker training. Um, I cannot emphasize enough how enriching and potentially exhausting that can be for an animal. You know, I have my own consulting business. I, I work at a shelter. Uh, I've got multiple, my hands in multiple pots. And so when I do my taxes, it's a train wreck and I'm not good at math either. So I'm exhausted when I'm done. And that's what clicker training does to your cat. When they're learning something new, even if they don't fully learn the process, just the attempt, the thought process is exhausting. Um, and Fernando, before I give you the next question, we, we're getting a lot of um, sort of managing, understanding and managing problematic behavior questions. Um, and so um, while I'll pose a couple to you, I do want to remind everyone that in the chat, I did put a link to Fernando's webinar. He actually tackled this uh, very <laughs> same topic. Um, why does my pet do that? Understanding and managing problematic behaviors. Um, and so the link to that recording is in the chat. Um, we can always email it as well. Um, and, and I'm just saying that just in case Fernando doesn't get to all of all of your questions. Um, 
So, uh, Fernando, um, in general, um, how can someone reinforce positive play behavior uh, that avoids biting? Good question. Um, it, it, there, there's some variations. You know, when you're dealing with kittens, it's, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, but the core of it is really providing an appropriate outlet so they have that ability to chew and kick um, as much as they want to. And I, I don't know what they're called, but they have these like little like, long pillows that are meant for cats. And often they have catnip in them. I love those because they're just a perfect size and shape for a cat to latch onto and bunny kick. Um, and so giving them that option is great. The other thing is using these training methods, both the play therapy to release the, release the extra energy and the quicker training to show, to teach more appropriate interactions can help with these behaviors. Another question we've been getting in, in a variety of forms um, is about leash training a cat and how to start that uh, process um, and evaluate. That is awesome. I have not heard that one before in this kind of venue. Um, and so it, it is a process and you know, there's the introduction of the leash and, and showing, hey, look, here's this thing. Um, you know, with cats, you need a harness as well. Um, and, and I would actually, I did this once with uh, one of my main coons because he just loved going outside, uh, but I wanted him to be safe. And so start off with, here's the harness, quick treat. And once we're showing that we're not afraid of the harness, here's the harness going over your head, quick treat, remove and repeat. And so breaking down that process. And then once we have a cat that's comfortable with the harness, then we look at attaching the leash and same thing, go slow, offer reinforcements, um, repeat the behavior, and then let them drag it for a little bit in the house. So they get used to the feel of this pull, this thing pulling on them, because that's unnatural. You know, for this wild hunter that you've taken into your home, now we're trying to tame them. And that we have not done in 10,000 years. So um, getting them used to the idea that they have this thing attached to them now is going to be necessary. And then finally, once we're in a good position where they're used to it and you're able to walk around with them, take them outside and go slow. I still recommend bringing treats with you. Um, so you can make all their interactions a positive one, um, but expect that they are going to lead the way. They're going to explore. They're going to want to investigate. Um, and we have very little say in where they go, aside from maybe stopping them from a potentially dangerous place or place that we can't follow in with them, like if they go into bushes. Another question uh, that we're getting is, um, the best way to uh, introduce um, New, a new cat into a, a cat household. Um, and uh, what we're getting a lot of feedback on is that um, people have um, adopted uh, an additional cat um, in order to keep the uh, primary cat um, company. And we, th they're, they're uh, facing some challenges in that introduction. Okay. Um, so cats can coexist with other cats. That said, I'm always very cautious about getting a cat for a cat. Um, you know, they, they have their territory and their space and they, they need to feel like they have enough of that, regardless of how big or small it is. Um, now, if you want a cat for yourself, by all means, um, but I, I also look at your cat's experience with other cats. Um, have, they, have they been around other cats? And still recognizing that this is a new individual you're potentially bringing in uh, and, and weigh all that into effect and how much attention you're giving to the, in the first cat um, before you get a second cat. Um, so it's, it's very rarely a good idea to get a cat for a cat because you don't have time for the first cat. Um, that's just not going to go well. Now, assuming you already have a cat in your home and you brought this other cat and you've made a decision, kudos, great for you, um, still can work. Um, I would look at that initial, that, I think it was the first slide I showed or second slide, um, containment for the new cat. Give them a nice safe space to get used to their, their, their new home. Uh, we can swap scents. So fabric, uh, fabric toys, towels, bedding, um, switch back and forth so they get used to the smell of another cat. Um, and then I break down the process into, I would say probably three major steps. One, I'm doing training on either side of the door. I'm feeding on either side of the door. Uh, so the cats are kind of interacting through a physical object. Um, then I, if that's going well and there's no hissing, uh, I might go to the next step where they can now see each other. Now this can be double baby gates. If you have fortune of having a glass door, awesome. Um, or even just crack the door and put a weight behind it so they can't actually physically get in. Just make sure it's no bigger than their head because if they can fit their head through, they can fit all of them through. Um, 
And again, same process, we're feeding, we're training, we're doing quicker training, creating positive associations um, and watching out for growling, hissing, you know, inappropriate behaviors. Um, I, I often get clients who tell me, oh, my cats get along great, they just hiss now and again. And it's kind of like living with a roommate or significant other who kind of randomly just yells at you every now and again. It's still not good. You still don't feel safe and secure. Um, and so you want to make sure that that's completely gone away. Now, if you go to the next step and you start getting significant hissing and growling, you might want to take a step back and say, okay, let's spend a little more time at this, this last step that we were successful at. Maybe I went too fast for this cat. This cat's just not ready for the next step. Last step is, is really kind of a controlled introduction. Um, I try to find a separate room to introduce both cats. Uh, I'm there to watch, make sure you know there's no full escalation. I'm prepared to intervene through making noise. Um, you never want to grab onto two cats fighting. You're very likely to get bit or scratched. And cat bites and cat scratches can lead to very significant uh, infections. If you don't already know, um, they don't look as bad as dog bites, but they're usually significantly worse. Um, if you have an altercation, separate. So go back to that last step. Now, if you've already introduced your cats and you're having problems, at that point, I would look at separating the cats and restarting that process. Um, and look at, while you're doing that, look at your space, your territory, what options your cats have to get out of uh, the other cat's way. Fantastic. Um, one question we're getting a lot in the chat um, and uh, is about wet food feeders. Um, I know that the two that I prefer, um, uh, again, this is uh, just my personal preference, uh, are licky mats. And um, there's also a cat it play foraging mat, I believe. It's mm -hmm. something along those lines. Um, those are both appropriate for, for wet food. We're getting a lot of questions in the chat about uh, wet food feeders. I don't know, Fernando, do you have any uh, preferences? Not really. Um, I, I've used the licky mats. Um, I typically, my feeding has always been, I give kibble in, in play toys, and then I give them a small amount of wet food um, on something like a licky mat, um, just to get that extra moisture and enrichment. Um, and I usually try to actually pair that in with training sessions so they're getting all their wet food that way. Um, so I, I don't really provide just wet food by itself. Right. Um, one person is saying that their cat is, seems to be scared of most toys. Uh, what could they do to make him feel safer? Okay, well, um, there's actually a really cool training phenomenon where you're doing training sessions around things you're scared of, learning something new around something you're afraid of can naturally reduce the fear of that object, even if you don't physically or actively engage that object. So depending on how bad that fear is, you know, if they're like terrified and running away, then you really want to have that toy fought further away. Um, but if it's just a matter of maybe the ball makes a noise when it hits it and they get scared, then just do clicker sessions around that toy. Um, and you'll often find that over time, they'll choose to engage the toy and having that choice and having that enriching uh, behavior or experience around that can help reduce that fear. We had a great question. Um, what are some initial missteps that a first time cat owner should try to avoid when offering cat enrichment? That's a good question. Um, making sure that they're, they're appropriate for cats is, is really huge. Um, I, I can't tell you how often I see cats with toys, you know, that we think of as humans, yeah, this is a great thing for the cat. Um, and yes, the cat engages it and has fun, but it's not necessarily safe. Like the twisty ties I commented on earlier. Um, you know, the little milk rats are kind of very similar to that. Um, laser toys, very, very common, whether they're hand operated or they're robotic ones um, that are automated. Th those are, you know, really common toys that are provided for cats that really don't provide enrichment. Um, aside from that, it's really just finding something that works with your cat, um, really giving them opportunities to ex engage and, and try a different environment. Um, probably the, the, the biggest uh, thing that I see, if, if anything, is not switching toys out. So if your cat has, let's just say three toys, and those are the three toys they always have, and it's always there, that stops being enrichment. Because um, enrichment, by definition, is really just change. And so changes in the environment and in, in, in their interactions is what causes the enrichment. And so they need to have that cycled out. The question we had was in regards to uh, breed. So does a cat's breed change their reactions to training? 
Uh, yes and no. I mean, there's some of the exotic breeds that you can definitely say there's, there's a different reaction. Um, when you talked about a Bengal earlier, uh, those can be a little bit harder to, for some people, especially first time cat owners to, to manage. Um, but really the ones that are harder to manage, they're the ones that benefit the most from the training um, because you're giving them that outlet. Um, these are typically cats that are more closely related to the wild cousins, um, whether it be two or three generations or, or more. Um, and, and so they, they still have some of the more wilder behaviors, um, but the enrichment is, is great for them and it gives them that outlet. Um, and our, our final question is in regards to uh, toy selection. Um, so which kind of toy is better, um, an electronic toy or something that is made of another material like plush or plastic, more manual? So that's going to depend on your individual. I will say that when I'm introducing either fearful or unsocial kittens, um, I like the robotic toys because I'm not involved. And so if I'm dealing with a situation where my presence is an aversive, you know, I show up and the cat's like, I'm hiding behind the toilet or I'm hiding under the bed, then I need something that's separate from me so they can engage it, they can play, and they can feel like they're, they're safe. And then I move into more, um, objects that, that are more ma manually operated um, to provide more of a connection with, with the person. Um, uh, uh, probably my favorite toy though, is gonna be one of those wand type toys um, that really engages the cat, gives them an opportunity to engage with you and you're part of that process. Um, and all but the most fearful cats typically engage to some degree. Um, and even if they're really that scared that they're just sitting there watching the toy, they're still getting something from it. You leave the treat and they're making progress and you're making that connection, building a relationship. Thanks, Fernando. We got a lot of amazing questions. So we want to ask um, people that if we didn't get to your question today, because we had so many, um, and Fernando, believe it or not, has yet another training that he's got to get done in a few minutes, um, please go ahead and submit your questions to us. You can reply to the main email that was associated with this webinar, outreach at PasadenaHumane.org. You can also visit PasadenaHumane.org slash training um, and go ahead and register for a uh, behavior consult um, over the phone um, or a virtual behavior consult. Um, and that might help you address some more specific questions in regards to your pets. Um, Fernando, thank you so much for this amazing webinar. Um, we really appreciate it. And we hope to see everyone next time. Thanks, Fernando. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone. Time.